Здравствуйте. И добро пожаловать на Google Developers Day в Москве. Hello and welcome to Google Development Day in Moscow. My name is Dmitry Polukhin. I am Tech Lead Manager. This year we are holding several events like this. The first one was Developers Day in Prague last week, and this time we are holding such an event in Moscow. I'm hopeful that such events show high highly Google values Russian developers and the prospects of Google development in Russia. Possibly many of you know that we have two offices in Russia, in Moscow and in St. Petersburg. I hope that it will be difficult to find in this uh, room anybody who has never heard about uh, Google Wave. We also take part in this project. Russian developers help developing toolkits, and we're going to have a separate breakout session for that. Another breakout session will be on another project, which allows to safely execute binary applications in the browser, which uh, requires a, a great deal of computation on the client part. On top of that, Russian developers take part in improving Google and uh, Google Search. Uh, but this list could be continued. And now I'd like to invite here Product Management Director Eric Telemann. Eric, you're welcome. Thank you, Dmitry. Welcome again, Eric. Today. Can you hear me? Yes. Welcome. Many of us at Google and our partners have worked hard to prepare uh, this event. And we're really delighted to be here today in Moscow to spend the full day with all of you. I hope you'll find all the sessions uh, interesting, exciting, and fun. And what we'd like to do first is go through a quick update of how the web is doing as a development platform, as well as give you an update on what we at Google are doing to continue to improve it. So if you take a look at this screen, it's amazing how the web has evolved in 10 years. The web used to be about app information. You used to go on the web to look things up. And then it became a place where you can do things like ordering things online and they show up um, at your door in the next few days. And more importantly, recently, what we've seen is full applications. A web page is not just a page anymore. It's often a fully fledged application. If you look actually at our, the world of applications, applications used to be mainly on the desktop in the traditional operating systems. And that graph up here is trying to show how the functionality and the richness of applications has evolved across time. And the truth is desktop applications are very functional these days, but most of the innovation there happened more than 20 years ago. In contrast, and this is what the blue line is about, the web as an application development platform has matured extremely fast in the, in the last couple of years. Some of the innovations that founded the web date back from maybe 10 years ago, HTML, CSS, but it's amazing how the browsers like Opera, Safari, Firefox, Chrome, both on the desktop and mobile platforms, and some of the leading devices like the Palm Pre or the Android or the iPhone, have made huge progress in just the last 12 to 18 months. And we've just talked about features and functionality, but speed is also extremely important. Yes, when you add 20% speed to an application, it makes a difference. People notice, more people use it, they are happier. But when you multiply the speed of execution by 100, which is effectively what has happened to JavaScript since it was created. And in just the last 12 to 18 months, the speed of execution of JavaScript has been multiplied by 10. That is huge. The things that you could not do that were impossible just two years ago are now possible. And we'll show some of these to you today. So there we are now. We have a development environment for applications on the web which is reaching parity with desktop native environments. And at the same time, it has huge benefits over the desktop. For users, no need to install applications, no need to upgrade. You don't think about any of these things. When you need your app, you just go to a URL and it's there. 
And you can go from anywhere. Your app, your data is always available. Whether it's your PC at home, on the other side of the earth, or from a mobile device. That is really powerful. Also, because of the connectivity and the internet, most of your applications can easily be natively collaborative. It's built into the genes of web apps to be connected with um, connecting users and connected. For enterprises, you get all the user benefits we've just talked about, but you also get reduced costs when you outsource your uh, infrastructure to the cloud, and you also get a much better interaction with your partners, your users, your customers. If your, your business is online, you have granularity of information about what people are doing with your products that is infinitely better than if they're happening offline where you don't know really what people are doing with, with your products. And then for you developers, this is an amazing platform. The web continues to be this place where you can launch things very quickly with very little cost and iterate. You can, the, the paradigm of making a fix, saving, reloading the page and checking and testing is still working today. It's amazing. That makes it a really, really fast platform to iterate. It's OS agnostic. It will work on any of the operating systems. Um, and it's also based on a lot of open standards, which is very future-proof and means a lot of innovation. So there we are today. We have a platform in our hands that has reached parity again with the desktop on functionality and speed and has intrinsic advantages that make it the platform of choice. Now, we've talked about how you've seen that blue line of how the web is catching up as a platform, but we haven't said how. What we'd like to do in the next few minutes is talk about uh, what we'll refer to as HTML5. For the purists in there, the standards are complex and some of the things we'll talk about are in the standards, some of the things that are happening outside of the standards, but it doesn't really matter. What is really important is that all these things are happening right now and they're really exciting. So we'll spend a few minutes showing you five important things going on in HTML5. For this, I'd like to ask Mal Pingrin to join me on stage for some demonstrations. Mark. And the first one we'd like to talk about is called Canvas. Have you ever drawn a diagonal line on a web page? Think about it. You know, it sounds like a very simple thing to do, but if you are trying to do it, what most often you end up doing is either creating an image on the server and then sending the image down the pipe, which is not very effective from a byte standpoint, it also means your interactivity with the, the, the line, the graph is reduced to the granularity of the image tag. Or you can use a plugin like Flash or other technologies, but then it's proprietary. Uh, plugins don't always work on all platforms like the mobile platforms. It's not great. It should be just a lot easier. That is exactly what Canvas does. With Canvas, which is a new tag in HTML5, you can now address the screen with pixel level control and, and do all the great things you've always wanted to do on the screen. And Mark's going to show you some examples of that. So this is a nice little demo. You can move your cursor around, draw little shapes, the balls follow you around, you can draw squares, you can draw lines. How does it work? It's all JavaScript. You have functions like this, create a new image, set the source, once it loads, you draw on the, uh, what's called the uh, drawing context of the canvas, and it has methods like draw image. And you combine that with a bunch of math, and you can draw anything you like on a, on a web page. The second one we'll talk about is video. If you've ever embedded video on your site, you know how hard that can be. Again, you're in the world of plugins, of proprietary technologies. Why is it that hard? It should be as simple to embed a video as you can embed an image, which was always there and simple with the image tag. Again, that's what HTML5 is introducing. With HTML5, you now have a video and an audio tags that are right there as part of the standard. That means they're part of the DOM. They can be manipulated in the DOM just like you manipulate an image or anything else, which makes it uh, open uh, in terms of not being proprietary and just extremely flexible and powerful. Let's take a look at it. So here are three separate movie trailers, all playing simultaneously. 
Each of them is being rendered within a canvas, which itself is being rotated, scaled, moved around on the screen. Some of them are under each other, some of them are over each other. By the way, we have sound for this. Where no player has ever gone before. Three movie trailers at once. How does it work? Again, it's just JavaScript. Video is an object in the DOM. Canvas is an object in the DOM. So that means you can start combining them with just a couple of lines of JavaScript. You can get, for instance, the X and Y dimensions of the video. Pass those off to the drawing context of the canvas. Call translate, rotate, scale. And you can start combining these now that they're all native to the web instead of being bolted on top of the web. Let's talk about location. Many applications would be a lot better if they knew where the user is, assuming the user agrees to uh, that. But location has been hard. It's been hard for two reasons. First, the technology providing location has so far been pretty limited. Yes, GPS is great but when it works, but it doesn't work indoor. And most desktops don't have GPS, and phones, you know, not all have GPS yet. Then you have IP addresses, and they're always there, but they're not very accurate. But now we have databases that have been built that use also the Wi-Fi identification, the SSIDs, as well as the cell IDs from the, the wireless cell towers. And if you combine all of this together, you actually get pretty accurate information in most situations. And the second thing is there now is a standard API called the Geolocation API as part of HTML5 that allows you, as a web developer, to retrieve that location information really easily. Let's take a look. So here's your basic geolocation demo. You can click to look up your location. Firefox pops up a little info bar saying such and such site wants to know your location. You can share location, don't share, or remember for this, this site. I'm going to click share location. It gets the latitude and longitude, passes that off to Google Maps. That looks, that looks pretty accurate. Where are we? Your calculated location, latitude and longitude. So as you saw, opt-in, standard API for client-side JavaScript to get your location and do anything you want with it within your application. So all this is great. And as I said, the, the web is natively connected. But there are cases where the user doesn't have a connection to the internet, either because they're maybe in a plane or because they're roaming and their, their data plan is too expensive, they don't want to use data. So for that purpose, we introduced two things in HTML5, database and app cache. With these two functionalities, you can actually provide a local experience when the user is offline. App cache allows you to basically tell the browser to cache part of your code. So it's like the, the, the browser cache, except you have control over it. It doesn't time out, and you choose what goes into it. And database is just a local database that you can use to store information from your app locally. That means suddenly your app can be functional even when the user is offline. It's also very powerful to deal with slow or high latency networks like mobile networks, in which case you can actually provide a very fast and responsive user interface and deal with the network separately, asynchronously, at the speed of the network. Let's take a look. So this is your basic sticky notes application. You can drag notes around. You can create a new note, type in it. Then I'm going to be brave and disconnect the network. Can you, can you prove that it's disconnected? I swear to God, we are, yay, we are not connected. How many times do you hear that? And I can reload from the remote web server. And all of my data is still there. All of the actual data in the sticky notes is stored locally in a SQL database within the browser. And the code is stored in what's called a manifest file, which is just a text file that you point to from your HTML page that lists the HTML, CSS, JavaScript, images, whatever resources you need in order to run the application offline. So all this is very exciting. But what that means is you and everybody else is going to start writing even more JavaScript. And you know what happens when you've got a lot of code running in the browser at one point because it's all in the same thread the UI becomes non-responsive and very sluggish, and that's a real problem. If you were coding a native application, 
you would just simply use a background thread. Well, that's exactly what web workers are for. They were introduced. So now, in, in when you're coding a web app, you can actually put your heavy-duty JavaScript in a separate thread in the background and continue to have your, your app be totally responsive. The browser tabs and UI continues to work. Mark, can you show us an example? So we showed you Canvas, which lets you draw arbitrary graphics on a web page. Then we showed you how you can combine video with Canvas to draw videos on a Canvas and then manipulate them. Now I'm going to add a third piece to the puzzle, which is background threads. This is a video which contains a, a person who will walk into the frame. Those red and green rectangles are being drawn in real time on top of the video. They're not part of the source video. They're being calculated by a background thread that's running in the browser in JavaScript that's detecting motion between the frames. Let me show you the actual code. This is all it takes to create a new background thread in JavaScript. You say worker equals new worker and then give it a path of the JavaScript file that you want to run in a parallel thread. Can you believe this? If, if someone had told me two years ago that we would be doing background processing and real-time motion detection in live video, all this with open standards in a browser, this is just amazing. And the good news is all of this is now already mostly available in all of the modern open source browsers out there. So you have something like about 500 million users out there who use these modern open source browsers that actually can take advantage of this today. And you've seen all the demonstrations in, in these various browsers. But we also recognize that there's a number of users out there who still use Microsoft Internet Explorer. That's why we announced a plugin called Chrome Frame. And with Chrome Frame, it's a plugin for Internet Explorer versions 6, 7, and 8, which you as a developer can choose to invoke. And when you invoke this, suddenly the tab is actually rendered by the Chrome technology. Chrome Frame contains all the good open technologies we've talked about and many more, as well as Google Chrome's JavaScript engine. So the combination of the two now means that virtually almost all Internet users can actually benefit from all the great open technologies we've just seen. Let's take a quick look. This is the application that you saw for our first demonstration of Canvas. And when we first showed it to you, this was actually in Google Chrome. Now, if you take a look, this is the exact same code running in Windows Internet Explorer. And if you do a right click, you can actually see that it's invoked Chrome Frame. So this is how you get the benefit of HTML5 and open technologies right into the three versions of Internet Explorer. At this point, I'd like to spend a, a, a minute answering a question that some of you may already have on your mind and that a lot of people ask us. Why is Google caring so much about open technologies and making the web better? And there's two fundamental reasons. The first one is that openness and, and open source is in the genes of Google. When Larry and Sergey first created the first versions of Google Search in their dorm rooms at Stanford University, they used a lot of open source software. And since then, at Google, we've hired a lot of folks and engineers coming from the open source community. So generally speaking, there is a lot of us at Google who like to use and contribute to the open source community. In addition, Using, you know, making the web faster and using open technologies makes a lot of business sense for us at Google. It makes business sense because the more, the more open the web is, the more powerful the web is, the more apps and the richer apps you guys and everybody else in the developer community produce. And when these apps are more interesting, we see a lot more users coming to the internet faster and we see them using the web more. And when that happens, guess what? When people use more of the web, they go more often on Google, and they do more searches, and they click more on ads, and we make more money, which means we can reinvest that into making the web better. So that's a very simple loop that uh, you know, also shows why, from a business standpoint, it makes a total sense for us to be focused on making the web better. Backing a, a step in terms of our strategy, um, there's two fundamental parts of what we're doing for developers. 
One of them is making the web more powerful and more pervasive. And the way we do this is with things like Google Chrome, Google Chrome Operating System, and Android. I'll talk a little bit more about these three things in a minute. The other part of our strategy for developers is centered around tools. We have a, a number of tools that we are releasing and continuously improving, and we're releasing more tools regularly. Um, and again, we'll talk about them a little bit later in this presentation. It's things like App Engine, Google Web Toolkit, our APIs, etc. I'll touch on all of these now. There's obviously a lot of sessions throughout the day that you can go to to find out more about these. Let's start with a few words about Chrome and the Google Chrome operating system. So a bit more than a year ago, we launched Google Chrome. And the reason we did this was really to focus and try and reinvent the browser based on simplicity, security, and speed. And if you've seen the blue line with the speed of innovation since we've introduced Chrome, I think you know, this is a testament to how good an idea it was to introduce a new browser and really speed up development of the platform. Some of the new things that we've uh, introduced recently with Chrome include extensions. Extensions are a really powerful way of adding value to Google Chrome. They're already available to developers. And, and if you know how to code a web app, you know how to code extensions. It's based on the exact same stack, HTML, CSS, etc. So it's a really simple way to extend Chrome. We've also released themes. And what we've also announced recently is the Google Chrome operating system. The reason we did this is we keep hearing from users that Chrome is great, but they're still not happy with their computers. They'd like to be able to open their computer and have their mails right there. They'd like their computers to run a year later as fast as it first ran when they bought it. So what we're doing with Google Chrome operating system is basically it's our attempt to rethink an operating system from the ground up. Just like Google Chrome, it's focused on speed, simplicity, and security. Google Chrome operating system will be open sourced before the end of this year. And we expect to see netbooks, which is the initial target for this operating system, to be available in the second half of 2010. From a developer standpoint, Chrome OS is essentially Google Chrome plus a new windowing system running on Linux. So it's the web development platform like you know it, and any application that you're coding for the web will work on Chrome OS and vice versa. Let's talk a bit about mobile. Mobile is really exciting. If you've noticed, every time I've talked about browsers, I've talked about desktop browsers, but also mobile browsers and devices. The reason is we see a growth in mobile that is unprecedented. So if we take a look at this graph, this is third-party research that shows that we are already, this year, at around 500 million mobile users of the internet. And this does not include things like SMS, MMS, etc. We're talking about real applications that leverage the internet. And if you look at five years from now, we're talking about more than 1.5 billion people on this planet actually using the mobile internet. This is forecast, but let's look at another data point. At Google, since 2007, we've seen the number of search queries coming from mobile devices multiplied by five. And from this year on, in 2009, there are more new users of the internet that discover the internet from mobile devices than from PCs and laptops. Think about what that means for the growth path. So if you're not already working on a mobile version of your applications, think about it. While we're there, I'll give you a quick update on Android. Android is a full mo mobile software uh, stack for mobile phone manufacturers and mobile phone operators. A year ago, we had the first version, one device with one carrier. Today, we have 12 devices in the field with, in 26 countries with 32 carriers, and I'll let you read the rest. But the key thing is, the ecosystem, in particular around applications, is working. We have more than 12,000 applications in the market, and every user on the average downloads 40 applications. So very rich environment. We've just announced Android 2.0. I'll spare you the details, but two things I want to highlight. One of them is uh, better abilities for you developers to create sync components to sync any sort of data with the device, and also Great support for HTML5 and the features that I've just shown you with Mark just a few minutes ago. 
All right, moving on to the second part of our presentation, talking about tools. Uh, let's spend a few minutes just giving you a broad overview of Google Web Toolkit as well as App Engine. And for this, I'd like to ask Fred Sauer to join me on stage. Fred. Thank you, Eric. And good morning, Moscow. How are you? Good? All right. Um, so everyone's a developer here. How many of you have a computer? Raise your hand. Yeah, that's what I thought. OK. So when you open your computer and you turn it on, what's the first application that you launch? If you just think about it for a minute, what is the first icon that you click on every day when you turn on your computer? Browser, yes. Well, if you're like me, it is a web browser. And the browser is becoming more and more important. And for me, it's the most important application on my desktop. And increasingly, users expect to access their data in the cloud. They want to be able to access any application on any device, anytime, anywhere. And thanks to HTML5, users can use powerful applications like Gmail, both online and when they're offline, in a web browser. Now, it's becoming increasingly clear that the web is winning. The web, in fact, has won. It is won as the delivery platform for applications. And that's why you're all here. You're building for the web. You're building applications. So I'd like to talk to you about three products, three Google developer products that help you build and deploy web applications to the cloud in a very scalable way. Now, these three applications make you much more productive as a developer. And when you're productive, you can focus on building great applications for your users. The, um, the first one I want to talk to you about is Google App Engine. Uh, Google App Engine uh, is, uh, we launched a version for, that uh, supports Java in April and May of this year. And now we've had Python support since then, but um, since the launch of Java, we've seen a real uptake in adoption on App Engine. In fact, over 250,000 developers have deployed an application to App Engine. That's a lot of developers. And not one of these developers had to configure or provision or purchase a server in, the, uh, in order to get started. There were no database licenses needed and no operating system licenses. And each one of these applications has uh, free monthly quotas. In fact, a, a well-written um, application can probably use around 5 million page views a month of free quota. And those developers only pay for the resources they use above and beyond those free quotas. Now, Google App Engine allows you to build very powerful applications in the web, but those powerful applications need equally powerful user interfaces. And those user interfaces can be built with Google Web Toolkit. Now, Google Web Toolkit allows you to focus on what you do best. You build applications. You build applications for your users. And Google Web Toolkit does this by providing you very powerful Java tools. These tools make you more productive. Now, I'm telling you about how easy it is to build these applications in the cloud and deploy them to the cloud. And it's so easy that I want to show you. It's um, just going to take a, a few minutes here. And here we go. So this is Eclipse, the IDE that allows you to develop on Windows, Mac, or Linux. And I've installed the Google plugin for Eclipse. This makes it very easy to work with Google Web Toolkit and Google App Engine. And we're simply going to create a new project. And because we're in Moscow, we're going to call the project Moscow. And notice that we've checked the box for Google Web Toolkit and the box for Google App Engine. Now, this creates a default project that we can get started with. And before we look at the source code, I'm just going to run this application and see what it looks like. Here we go. This is our starter application. And it's asking us for a name. So I'm going to type in my name. 
and I'm going to click send, and this is going to send this message to the server. And the server receives my name, and it replies back, hello, Fred. So that's great. So let's look at the source code for this application. Now you see we have a server package here. This contains a Java servlet, which is uh, just regular Java code that gets converted to bytecode when it's compiled. And you see here that it takes a name, and then it ultimately replies with hello name. We also have a client package here, and this is Google Web Toolkit code. This is Java code that creates the user interface, the pop-up box and the, the buttons. And you'll see a method here near the end called send name to server. And what I'd like to do is actually set a breakpoint here. And on the server, I want to do the same thing. I want to set a breakpoint so I can pause the execution of the program while it's happening. So now I'm going to hit the send button again, and you'll see that Eclipse will start flashing at the bottom. And it stopped at this breakpoint. So I can look at the variable value here, and it shows that I've typed the name Fred. But I realized that I made a mistake. I never modified this program. I wanted to say that I am famous. Everyone wants to be famous, right? So I'm going to save it, and then I'm going to resume execution. And now the message has been sent to the server, and I've hit another breakpoint on the server. And I can look at this value that was sent, and you can see that it's been modified. It's now the famous Fred. But the server disagrees. So I'm going to change that value, actually. I'm not going to change code. I'm just going to change the variable value. So the server thinks I'm not famous. And I'm going to hit Resume. And you see that the browser is paused here. The button is grayed out, and it's, it's waiting for a response. And I go back. And there you see I've modified the code that sends the value, and the server's seen an updated one. So that's a, a very simple application that we quickly created. But I can only use it here on this laptop. And what I really want is everyone in the audience to be able to access this application. So I'm going to hit this button. And I'm going to set an application ID. And then I just have to type in my username and password. And this will upload my application to Google App Engine in the cloud. Now this takes about a minute and 20 seconds, a minute and 30 seconds. And while this is happening, I'd like you to think about the last time that you built an application on your PC or your laptop, and you had to upload it to a server so other people could use it. You had to find a server. You had to configure it. Maybe you had to install a database server. Uh, you had to configure a web server. Um, you had to figure out what you do with logs. Maybe you had to write some scripts to take the files from your PC and move them up. Uh, you had to take care of quite a lot of things. Now, here in the App Engine, um, all we do is we upload our code, and we're done. Now, what's just happened is the Java code in the client package has been compiled to JavaScript, so users can use it without plugins. And the Java code in the server package is bytecode, which runs in the server. And everything has been grouped together and uploaded. So now let's see what that looks like. So now we're accessing this application in the cloud. Fred, there you go. So you see the modified code is, has taken effect. We've deployed an application in the cloud in just a few minutes. Isn't that wonderful? Yes, yes. OK. So remember, it's any application on any device, anytime, anywhere. Thank you. Eric? Thank you so much, Fred. So impressive demonstrations. I hope that gives you a lot of ideas of things you could be doing. It's pretty exciting. But what you've seen so far is demos, bouncing balls and lines and stuff. 
But we actually at Google are working on some very large and serious applications that leverage that technology. So we thought we'd spend a few minutes showing one to you. It's an application that is using a lot of the HTML5 functionality that we've talked about. It's an application that we have built with Google Web Toolkit that we just could not do without Google Web Toolkit. And it's also an application that has a lot of exciting APIs that I think you will want to take advantage of. The application I'm talking about is Google Wave. And I'd like to ask two of the creators of Google Wave to come on stage to tell us about it, Stephanie Hannon and Lars Rasmussen. Thank you. Thank you. Я расскажу вам о Google Wave. Вы, вы, спасибо. Вы меня понимаете? Да. Я нет. As you can tell, I trust my Russian colleagues completely. They could have taught me to say absolutely anything. I thought you were going to do the whole thing in Russian. <laughs> Unfortunately not. So Google Wave, we're going to show you a super short demo today before we tell you about the things you can build on top of Google Wave. There is a much longer demo available on um, YouTube. It's an hour and 20 minute long. Um, actually, who, who's had a chance to watch the video already? Oh, wow, OK. Who's watched all of it? OK, not quite so many. <laughs> Two. OK, good. It's the longest video ever watched on the internet legally. Stephanie. <laughs> So let me tell you really briefly what Google Wave is. This is Sydney, Australia. That's where the whole Wave team lives. We built Google Wave in Sydney. I wanted to point that out because it's one really exciting thing about the internet and cloud computing that you could be sitting in Prague or Moscow or in Sydney and build a product for the world. Um, what is Wave? Well, we tried to, um, thanks. <laughs> this is what computers looked like when email was invented more than 40 years ago. We tried to take inspiration from all of these. This is a small sampling of all of the innovations that have happened um, since then, and out popped Google Wave. So let me tell you the premise or the difference between email and Wave. Email mimics snail mails. Copies of messages get sent around. Wave starts with the definition of a hosted conversation. There's a single copy that lives in the cloud. People log in and interact with it. With this simple change of metaphor, we think you can do in one tool what today you would pick many tools to do. So there are a lot of people who claim that Wave is too complicated, too difficult for people to understand. We, of course, completely disagree. There was someone, we don't know who it is, who put up a site where users can vote for how simple Wave is. And so here you can see, OK, um, here you can see that our, okay, our own existence apparently is simpler than Google Wave. Can you click Google Wave real quickly? Um, okay, so osmotic pressure is also simpler than Google Wave. Click again real quickly. Okay, oh no, men also simpler. Keep clicking, <laughs> keep clicking. There we go. Hey, Google Wave is simpler something than the need. United States tax we code. How US hard can it code. be? <laughs> One great thing about having real <laughs> one you never know what's going to come up there. That's what makes this exciting. One great thing about having users now is they can help us tell the story of what Wave is. We're going to show you a video that a really creative guy in Los Angeles made. He took the soundtrack of a famous movie and recreated it inside of Wave. Now we can't show you the whole thing because the language gets a little bit colorful. But Excellent. we hope you enjoy it. It's very you colorful. With the best intentions, really. I never... Oh, I'm sorry. Did I break your concentration? I didn't mean to do that. Please, continue. You were saying something about best intentions? What's the matter? Oh, you were finished. Oh, well, allow me to retort. What does Marcellus Wallace look like? What? What country you from? What? What ain't no country I ever heard of. They speak English in what? What? English, <laughs> do you speak it? <laughs> yes. OK, cut it off. <laughs> That's good. Sorry about that. You can see the rest on YouTube. <laughs> Thank you. 
Okay, let's do a really quick demo. I'm gonna start um, a new wave here, and I'm gonna type a title in the first line. Panic time, hey Steph. We only have five minutes. I have never done the demo in less than one hour. What are we gonna do? Lars, and then I'll add Steph to the wave. And Stephanie's offline. Oh, she's you're really gonna give, offline. You're going to give me one second. <laughs> she's really offline. This is where I start dancing. Um, so Stephanie comes online after a little while, and she sees this wave, and she, just like an email, can make a reply to my wave. She's wow. almost there. Sorry, why don't um, you put Andrew on the wave just oh, as that's a, an interim excellent idea. solution? Sorry. Good to always have a backup. Andrew over. Okay, someone is gonna come online and make a reply to my way. There we go, hey Andrew, don't worry. Says Andrew, we will work something out, we always do. And so you can see we can switch back and forth between email type conversations and instant messaging type conversations and I can continue here, but, 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 like this. And then, are you a, pa what? No. <laughs> He's supposed to make me less nervous, not more nervous. Okay, so in Wave you can put a reply anywhere using these blue lines here, and even to the interior of a message. I'm going to make a reply to myself here by double clicking and hitting reply, and I can type, let's write a short script like this, and then Stephanie can continue that thread. We call this an inline reply. We let you edit your own messages after you've hit done, but we also let you edit other people's messages, which has the nice effect that you can collaborate on content inside a wave. And I'll show you this now. I'm just gonna collapse this inline reply and then choose to edit this message here and then we can write a script here. And then uh, Stephanie and Andrew, and let me just add, you can add Vadim. Vadim as well, yeah. can come in and edit the script with me. And you can see Andrew and Stephanie shows up um, inside my message as I'm editing it, and they can put together the script for me. And again, you can see character by character liveness in there. And so in the beginning, when you first see this, this can be a little chaotic, but once you learn how to use it, it's remarkable how much faster you can collaborate on content in this way. Okay, let's see what's next. Inline reply, playback. Playback is next. Let me show you. I'm going to hit done here, and then this playback button here lets me see how the wave was created step by step. There you see I started the wave. I added Stefan Andrew. Andrew said this. I said this. He said this. Our little inline discussion here, and you can even see the edit step here. We keep track in our database character by character of exactly who said what. What's next? Photos. Photos. Yes, let's absolutely show some photos. I happily have some lying on my desktop. I'm gonna make a new reply, and I'm gonna grab a bunch of photos from my desktop and drag them into the browser like this. And you will see that we automatically create thumbnails and automatically upload them to the server like this. I have some completely unrelated photos I'm and gonna Stephanie's drop in. Stephanie's gonna add some completely unrelated photos. You'll notice how fast I show up on my screen here, but we actually create the thumbnails in Stephanie's browser and send the thumbnails on the wire before her images are even done uploading. Andrew's gonna do some photos. Andrew, <laughs> throw in some photos. That would be cool too. <laughs> Almost as much fun as me doing it. Okay, two opportunities for me to dance. Here's Andrew, he's got photos. Put your thumb up if you got photos there, otherwise we'll work around it. That was a thumbs down. Okay. I got now. it, I got it, I'm back. I got <laughs> photos. This is fun live debugging. Mm -hmm, yeah. Andrew, Stephanie, everyone's here. Stephanie's got photos and Stephanie's photos. Yay! Just like <laughs> Start you. our own applause for getting now, those photos. I up. can view all of our photos as a slideshow. Look how both my photos and Stephanie's photos show up here. And so you've seen us collaborate on text. We can also collaborate on a photo album. And in fact, 
you can collaborate on pretty much anything by using our extension APIs, which is really what we're here to talk about. So the first thing we want to show, you probably better do that. Spelly. Spelly. Spelly yep. demo. So this is an extension that we build ourselves um, using what we call a robot. A robot is a server-side piece of software that can interact with a wave just like a user can do. And we build our spell checker using these APIs. Vadim is going to show you a Russian example, which I would read Vadim to you. Vadim is one of our um, API engineers. He's hiding in the audience here. And so you'll see that Vadim is deliberately making two spelling errors that are the same. And then on a good day, you have to make it edit. Yep, thanks, to make Lars. It edit mode. See, I told you you should do this. Yeah. So now you'll see the two red underlines here under the same word. And when Stephanie goes in and opens it up, uh, just hit control space. There you go. You'll see that our spell checker actually figures out what I believe is the right thing. In a little bit of the wrong place. Yeah, so ignore <laughs> where it was in the wrong place. Thank you. So this spell checker is trained on the entire web. It uses the context of the word. That's how I got the right answer there. Great. Now, We're going to show you a few more extensions that other people have built inside of Wave. My favorite is something called Sudoku. This was built by an Israeli company called Lab Pixies. Lars is going to start a wave and then add some of our team members. Now, Sudoku was already a Google gadget. It was an individual player game you played against the clock. What Lab Pixies did in a few weeks was bring it into Google Wave and make it collaborative so many people could be working on the same square at the same time. It was supposed to be um, collaborative. We'd solve a puzzle together, but it ended up being more competitive, and now you race against each other. And I can tell you it's the most addictive thing in the world, so don't start playing it if you have real work to do. You'll see the, the, the colors represent the carrots, so you can see where the other people are. And then you can hopefully see the scores. You get a point off, of course, if you get something wrong. Now, the Google Wave platform takes care of transmission of data, resolution of conflicts. All the gadget developers had to do was store the state of the game in XML in the Wave. Now, the next thing we want to show is a prototype uh, extension that was built by one of the world's largest software companies, SAP, that's based in Germany. So this is a business process modeling tool, which is actually quite sexy inside Google Wave. The demo video here, which you can find on our page of featured extensions, yeah, goes through a scenario where a bank and an insurance she company is merged, and the new and uh, company wants to build activity. a business process. While can John you cut the sound? Oh, yeah. the wants to build a business process for their new company. And so SAP had this drawing tool here where you can draw business processes alone, but by putting it inside Wave, immediately many people can work on this graph simultaneously in real time. And so they go through, starting out with two people drawing this thing, they add an expert. A little bit later, you'll see they add a robot, just like our spell checker. This robot goes and checks the semantic correctness of the graph and suggests a few changes. Then they add the manager. The manager actually checks the work on an iPhone. This thing renders on an iPhone. And then in the end, they click a button and export the graph in XML into this enormous software package that SAP has called NetWeaver. And a web developer can turn the graph into an actual website interacting with users. And then, and this is not in the video yet, but SAP also built a gadget that you can put in the same way that monitors in real time the workings of the live website. And then the people on this wave here can go and fiddle change the graph a little bit, the programmer can update the website, and they can see the results. So it dramatically shortens the cycle of work and makes everything collaborative. The other example I want to show you is by an American company called ThoughtWorks. It's mostly a consulting company, but they have a product division called ThoughtWorks Studio that built a, a very nice integration between a Mingle and Google Wave. So Mingle is a project management tool for agile software development. And you will see here how it works. It has these little cards with tasks on. And the integration with Google Wave lets a programmer see, in this case, the daily the tasks that are due that day inside a Wave. If you can fast forward a little bit. Oh, not so much. Sorry about that. 
Sorry. Go back a little more. Trying. Sorry about that. There we go. So you can see the tasks inside a wave. And, and the way this works is that there is a robot on this wave. You can see it up there. Goes and grabs the task from the Mingle database, puts it in a wave. And so now the programmer's manager shows up. She's unhappy, asks, why are things not moving forward? And then the programmer uh, thinks on his feet and quickly remembers what task is blocked. And all he has to do is write hash 88, and the robot sees that, goes and fetches the corresponding task from the database, puts it right in the wave for him and the manager to see. Then the, uh, the manager asks, what are you going to do? Again, the programmer thinks on his feet, and he's going to come up with a new task right inside wave. And then he's going to use the robot on the wave to create a task in the database without ever leaving wave. You'll see he's going to, he's going to select the appropriate text here, and then he's going to hit a button on the toolbar, which is actually a button that the extension put in the toolbar, and then the robot's going to do all the work for him. There. Now the robot goes, creates the task, and puts the task inside the wave. And now in a second, they'll go back to the Mingle page, and you'll see those new tasks on the Mingle page. And also, we have an API where you can embed waves on your website, and then you, if you happen to be on the Mingle site, you can go and look at the waves in there. Great. So we've showed you a bunch of extensions to Wave. If you want to learn how to build them, Vadim has a breakout session this afternoon called Google Wave APIs. But this is the reason we're here to talk to you to try and inspire you guys to build Google Wave extensions or embed Wave's places in the wa web. You want a rich UI for collaboration and discussion. We think Google Wave can only be a success, and we can only get people to adopt it and use it if people like you um, invest your time and energy in the platform. So please come meet us today and talk to us about Wave. I just want to say a few things about how it's going. We started our preview about six weeks ago. We said we'd send out 100,000 invites. We've actually sent out more than a million invites. And we have more than half a million seven-day active users. And the early feedback is that people really like it. They're coming back and using Wave. Now, for developers, we often get the question, how am I going to make money from this platform? So first of all, you can look at the Sudoku gadget we showed you earlier, and you'll already see ads there. These are Google ads in this example, but they could be any ads. So that's one way developers could make money. But we're more commonly asked whether or not we're going to put together a marketplace of sorts where you, the developer, can sell your extension to our users. While it's too early for me to promise that, we think it would be pretty stupid not to do it. And we're not stupid. No. <laughs> um, so stay tuned. We'll try to share inform more information about our plans on our developer blog. So just to end off, I want to remind you guys that um, in addition to this platform we've shown you, uh, Wave is also a protocol. The underlying protocols that manage all this live interaction is open. You can read about it on waveprotocol.org. Um, and we've made some progress recently. Just uh, last week, we opened up an experimental federation port, as we call it, on our developer instance, which you guys should all be getting accounts for. Um, and we know of several organizations actually building their own wave servers, including um, American company Novell that just last week announced a project, I'm sorry, a new product called Novell Pulse. Um, and they announced that they were going to support the Google Wave Federation protocol from inside there. Now, lastly, I want to uh, just point out that um, you, you guys are all going to get accounts both in our developer sandbox and on our public preview instance. And I want to just shout out um, public waves. So there is a way to take a wave and make it public. It's total anarchy when you do this. Um, about half a million users can see your waves and participate in them. Um, but it's a lot of fun, too. And I want to, um, Steph, if you can click that link there. Um, there's folks here, so there's Wave Ninjas in the room here that have started several public waves about today's um, conference. And if you go and search for with public tag GDD 2009. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. to you guys. <laughs> well done. Um, uh, use these to discuss what's going on today. And of course, these will be with us for the future. And 
the two sessions later the today? The two sessions I want to call out. So um, Vadim and um, David over here are going to talk about uh, the Google Wave API so you'll learn how to build the things we showed you earlier. And uh, we're going to talk about how we built the client using the Google Web Toolkit. And that's, that's all we have to say. Spasiba. Das Vidania. Spasiba. Thank you. <laughs> Lara, Steph, thank you very much. All right, so we've gone through the browser strategy and how we make the, uh, the web more powerful and more pervasive. We've talked about App Engine and Google Web Toolkit. The last thing I'd like to spend a few minutes on is the different services and their APIs. Um, we have more than 60 APIs available for all our services. And um, do you want to go to the next slide? There's no way we can talk about all of them in this keynote, but there are dedicated sessions that will uh, tell you more about some of them. Uh, we actually get more than 4 billion calls to all these APIs every day at Google. Uh, most of them are JavaScript APIs. We also have RESTful implementations. We have client libraries. We also have cut and paste versions of a number of these products where you can really simply just cut and paste some lines of HTML and plug them into a page and it works immediately. As I said, we can talk about all of them, but we thought we'd just choose one and show you a little bit of how one works to give you a, a, a flavor of all of these services. And to do this, I'd like to ask Chewy to join me on stage. Chewy. Hello, everyone. Whoop. Are we on? Ah. Privet, uh, de la. I thought that would be really impressive, uh, but now Lars has done his thing. I, not so good. But um, OK, I'd like to talk a little bit about um, custom search engine. How many people have heard of custom search engine? OK, that's good. So the rest of you, this will be very interesting. Um, so let me then ask, how many people like Google search? Hopefully all of you. Yeah. Those of you who didn't put your hand up, very naughty. Um, how many of you like money? Yeah, OK, that's better. So uh, custom search is for people who like Google search and like money. Um, so that's quite good. Uh, in order to find custom search, simply go to Google, search for Google custom search. Fortunately, it's the first result. I've given up remembering URLs since I started working at Google. It's quite good. Um, you click on here, and I see Lars is logged in. Lars, I'm going to set you up an account so you can start making money. I hope that's OK. Um, th the deal with custom search engine is that it allows you uh, very easily to create a search engine containing information that you're interested in. Um, I'm going to create a search engine about video games, because that's what I know. You may have guessed by my appearance. I'm a bit of an engineer, like video games. Um, uh, search engine for video games. I'm going to stick to English, uh, but you'll be happy to see that uh, Russian is supported in here. Um, and I'm going to say search only sites I select. And in this case, I know that Eurogamer.net and uh, GameSpot.com are both pretty good resources for video games. Now, I could click this box here and say search the entire web, but simply emphasize the sites I select. But I've chosen just to have a subset of sites. And this is good. If you own a handful of blogs or maybe a couple of content sites, you can create a search engine which will allow you to search just your content and return it to users. I'm going to stick with the standard edition, uh, which has ads, which is how I'm going to make money. But if you want a copy for your business, uh, from $100 a year, you can get results with no ads. And you'll actually get an XML feed that you can edit and play with and skim. So I've read and agreed to the terms of service. Uh, hit Next, and then hit Finish. And you'll see here is my video games uh, custom search. I'll hit the Control Panel. And down the side, you'll see a bunch of different options. So you can go back and edit this information at any time. You can change the sites that are available. Um, and you can actually preview the results. So I'm going to search for a game that is coming out any day now. And you'll see that there's some results blended in from the two sites that I've selected. Um, if I scroll down, you'll see you know, kind of all the different results. And you can page between them if you want to. I can change the look and feel. This is one of the new features uh, we've announced recently. Uh, I'm going to go with espresso, because coffee's always good. And then again, I can search down here uh, for different things. And I can actually preview the new style. And you can see that that's got you know, kind of red and brown as opposed to the standard Google search colors. If you want, you can customize that further using JavaScript, CSS, or just a wizard. But most importantly, how do you make money? Well, it's pretty easy. You click the Make Money button. Um, 
Yeah. <laughs> Easy enough, huh? You then uh, come to this page, and if you're an existing AdSense user, you can hook up your account. Uh, if you're not an existing AdSense user, so if you say, I already have one, that's fine. Or if you say, I'm a new one, uh, it'll give you a wizard to step through. You fill in your details, and you can start earning money instantly. You then simply hit Get Code, cut and paste this code, and drop it onto your web page. And that's all you need to do. Eric touched on the fact that uh, we're trying to provide a number of different APIs, cut and paste, uh, JavaScript, and then some RESTful stuff. Um, being able to cut and paste this code onto your website quickly allows you to test the feature. And then once you see that your users enjoy it, you can start to refine it a little bit. But it allows you very quickly just to get that functionality going. Uh, that's enough of that. Hopefully now you can see how to make money. If you'd like to learn more, I'm running a session at 2 o'clock, I think, which will go into more detail about this. Eric. Thank you. Thank you, Chewy. So we're getting close to uh, the end of this first session. Um, but Chewy introduced uh, a new concept. It was a lot about technology here this morning, but he talked about money. And we actually thought that to wrap this session up, it'd be interesting to hear uh, the perspective of guest speakers, so not people from Google, um, about how we can use this technology that's uh, coming to us and is really, really powerful now to actually turn this into useful applications and turn this into business. So for that purpose, I'm really delighted and please give a warm welcome to the founders of Wikimapia, Evgeny and Alexandre. Welcome. Приветствую. My name is Eugenie and I'd like to tell you a story of how uh, myself and my friend Alexander created a successful pro uh, project, uh, Wikimapia a project that has valued uh, more than one million dollars. Uh, all started uh, in spring 2006. By that time, we already had experience creating different websites, but we arrived at the conclusion that we needed to do something serious, something interesting. And we uh, looked at different popular sites. Uh, at about the same time, uh, we liked Google Maps, especially the satellite pictures. And we decided, uh, we thought of making our website based on or using uh, Google Maps APIs. At the same time, I had an idea uh, of uh, doing aerial images uh, when you do a kite and attach a camera to it or a large balloon, helium-filled balloon, and uh, start making pictures from that. And uh, so I started Googling the subject and quite by accident uh, ran across a link uh, at the Flickr site uh, with an aerial uh, photograph where buildings are shown as rectangles. And I thought, a great idea. Uh, so I sent this link to Alexander through ICQ and asked him, will we be able to do the same for the whole world at Google Maps? He, he says, I think so. And at the same day, uh, we uh, came up with the name uh, for the uh, uh, project, wrote a, a set of requirements in, se in several days and gave it to a freelancer to make. Uh, he tried to do but didn't. We took a different freelancer. Well, he came up with something, but uh, it was glitchy and didn't work very well. So we spent three months on that. And then we understood, we need to do something, because it doesn't work. So we decided, let's do it ourselves. Uh, to create such a website, uh, you need to know JavaScript. A lot of JavaScript is being used. And we didn't know it. So we just sat down to code uh, and to uh, sort it out as, as it went. So in two weeks' time of work, you know, we were working from morning till night, like waking up in the morning and working until, so we got the, few, uh, the first version of Wikimapia in two weeks. So we did the same as in the previous Flickr example, so that people could mark with a rectangle any object, add a description, Uh, before running the project, we marked up certain parts of the world. Uh, I was marking up Egyptian pyramids and Sasha the Chernobyl power plant. So we released the site. And uh, in a couple of days after the release, uh, the news about website uh, got uh, to the DCOM news website. 
uh, and from there it spread across a lot of uh, smaller websites. Somewhere, uh, so, uh, someone may, uh, made a mistake. There was Google and Wikipedia who started this website. Uh, and so we started getting a lot of traffic. We optimized the codes, uh, the code as we went. Uh, to make it work, and at that time we understood uh, that the idea uh, uh, was a hit rather than a miss, and this was success, so we needed to move it forward. And we had a lot of work to do. To do. Uh, in the beginning, uh, we were doing everything between the two of us, but then we understood we couldn't cope. Uh, we had to expand, we had to hire more people, and we started looking for an investor. We were talking with investors, and that is quite a lengthy process, it takes a lot of time, and uh, the proposals that we're getting from the investors were not uh, very attractive. But at the same time, uh, the hit rate of our website was growing. And in our website, uh, we put uh, Google uh, advertising, uh, which gave us uh, some uh, profits. And because the hit rate uh, was growing, uh, the revenues were growing as well. And sometimes we understood uh, that we didn't need any more in any investors from the outside. Mm. And so we started hiring people. Yeah. This summer, uh, we made a new version of Wikimapia. Now, instead of rectangles, people can mark uh, polygonal uh, objects, they can draw roads and rivers and many other things. So we get something like an interactive satellite map. You can point at anything and get the information, and, an, and you get a map juxtaposed based on the same data. In spite of the fact that we didn't spend a penny uh, on advertising and the hit rate of our website is doubling every year. So at present, it is about 600,000 hits a day. Uh, so we have a project team of six people, and we're actively expanding, looking for new programmers. If you wish, uh, just come to us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. So here we are. We have a development platform that is reaching parity with desktop platforms and has a lot of interesting advantages. As far as we're concerned in the debate as to which development platform is better, that debate is over. The web as a development platform has won. We're living an era of one of these revolutions is going through for computing and we're part of it. We now have the businesses, the ecosystems, the tools and the developers to make it all happen. So now it's time for you to take advantage of this amazing opportunity. Thank you again for being here today. We hope you have a great day and we'll just give you a few more information about the logistics of today. Spasiva.